Well, everybody, it's my 50th episode, and what better way to celebrate than by commemorating something far more important, 60 years of Godzilla. Yes, it was all the way back in 1954 that everybody's favorite radioactive monster first appeared on movie screens. And since then, he's gone on to appear in 30 movies, becoming a worldwide pop culture icon on par with characters like James Bond or Superman. Godzilla's been everything from an allegory for nuclear weapons, to a superhero defending mankind, and everything in between. And even when the critics haven't liked him, he's had a loyal base of fans from all across the world. In fact, if anything, Godzilla seems to be more popular than ever, since 2014 gave us not only a successful American adaptation of the character, but also the announcement that there'll be another Japanese installment too. Now, you may have already seen me poke fun at a few movies in the series, but I'm not the type of person to shit on a guy on his birthday. So instead, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Godzilla, I'm going to list off my own personal top 10 Godzilla movies. Number 10, Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster. This is an important entry in the series for a few reasons. One, it was the first appearance of King Ghidorah, a three-headed flying space dragon that would end up becoming Godzilla's most popular enemy and go on to appear in several other films. Two, this movie almost single-handedly invented the kaiju tag team battle. Before this, you just had monsters fighting each other one-on-one, -on -one, but now we have three of Japan's most famous monsters teaming up to take on Ghidorah, something that would get taken to an extreme and destroy all monsters. The plot involves a princess whose mind is being controlled by Martians. She tries to warn everyone about Ghidorah, claiming that he's responsible for destroying Martian civilization and that he'll do the same to Earth. But this is complicated by the fact that assassins are constantly trying to kill her. And what if she is the princess? If so, you will kill her. You know, you don't often see a hired killer wearing an outfit like that. Meanwhile, Godzilla and Rodan show up and spend most of the first part of the movie fighting each other. Both monsters had been bad guys up to this point, so this was a good way to get some monster action in before the final battle. Eventually, Mothra gets brought in to play mediator and convince Godzilla and Rodan to fight Ghidorah, but all they want to do is kick the crap out of each other. This was when the series was becoming more lighthearted, and although it's not as goofy as some of the later entries, there's still lots of humorous touches. Like when the monsters all sit down for a little chit-chat and the Mothra twins translate. Oh, Godzilla, what a terrible language! Eventually, the monsters put aside their differences and team up to take on Ghidorah. This film marked a turning point in the series where Godzilla would no longer be the villain and started being the hero, something that would continue for the rest of the original series. Overall, this is probably the best mid-period film of the original Godzilla series. It's more colorful than the early entries without being as silly as the later ones. And whereas Destroy All Monsters had so many monsters in it that a lot of them just ended up being brief cameos, here each one gets enough time to shine. With four of Japan's most popular monsters in one movie, how can you go wrong. Number 9. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. In the late 60s and continuing through the 70s, the Godzilla series got progressively goofier and sillier and were geared more and more towards children. Godzilla says that I should learn to fight my own battles, you know. This movie definitely fits in with that campy Saturday matinee style, but is easily my favorite of the bunch. The movie begins with a woman having a vision that a giant monster is going to destroy Tokyo, which considering she's in a Godzilla movie isn't really much of a prediction. A monster will set fire to the city! She might as well have just said the sun was gonna rise tomorrow. Godzilla shows up and starts causing trouble, which is weird since at this point in the series he's supposed to be a good guy. He even breaks Angelus' jaw in one scene. Damn! Angelus manages to rip away some of Godzilla's flesh, revealing metal underneath and cluing the audience in that this isn't actually Godzilla. Pretty soon the real Godzilla shows up and the imposter is revealed to be a robotic double of Godzilla. You could call it a Mecha Godzilla. You could, but in America they'll try calling him the Cosmic Monster and the Bionic Monster for some stupid reason. 
Mechagodzilla was created and is being controlled by aliens who look like rejects from a Planet of the Apes movie. Towards the end, another monster is introduced called King Caesar, a weird ancient god slash poodle monster. He even gets his own theme song. No, seriously, King Caesar doesn't even wake up until somebody sings to him. Mom. This goes on for three minutes. It's like the movie just turned into a musical all of a sudden. King Caesar finally gets his ass up and battles Mechagodzilla, only to get the crap kicked out of him. But fortunately, Godzilla comes along to help him out. They really pull out all the stops for the final battle here. Mechagodzilla uses finger missiles, toe missiles, knee cannons, chest lightning, rainbow death rays, rocket boots, force fields. It's like they tried to include every insane power they could think of. A strange thing about this movie is that even though it's one of the more kid-friendly entries, there's a lot of blood in it. Seriously, every time you see it, it's just gushing all over the place. It's like something out of Kill Bill. Even Godzilla bleeds in this movie. One of my favorite parts is when Godzilla suddenly turns himself into a giant magnet to defeat Mechagodzilla. Supposedly it's because Godzilla was struck by lightning earlier, but mostly it just comes out of nowhere. Like I said earlier, this movie is best appreciated if you don't mind a thick layer of cheese. The whole aliens controlling a monster to take over the Earth plotline was pretty standard at this point in the series, and there are some hilariously nonsensical lines of dialogue. This material can only be space titanium. Space titanium? You mean it's from outer space? Overall, though, this one is much more entertaining than the previous few movies in the series. Mechagodzilla would end up becoming one of Godzilla's major enemies and go on to appear in several more movies, but this one's still my favorite. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. It's campy, it's silly, but it's also a lot of fun. Number 8. Godzilla vs. Biollante. Believe it or not, this movie was actually the result of a contest Toho had where members of the public could send in script ideas for a new Godzilla film. One of the other scripts to be sent in would eventually become Gunhead. Yeah, I'm glad that one didn't win. This is one of the most underrated Godzilla movies, and it usually gets overlooked by fans, but it's actually one of the most ambitious and unusual entries in the series, and has a more thoughtful and detailed plot than your average Godzilla film. Scientists find some of Godzilla's cells and combine them with plant DNA in the hopes of making a super resilient plant that can grow in the desert. However, all it does is create a creature known as Biollante, a plant monster with killer tentacles that at first looks like a rose, and then a combination between a crocodile and the plant from Little Shop of horrors. What's more, the scientist responsible for creating Biollante is convinced that the soul of his murdered daughter is inside the monster too. Yeah, I guess I can see the resemblance. Meanwhile, Godzilla returns to wreak havoc on Japan, and the two monsters end up on a collision course. One of this movie's biggest strengths is that the human part of the story has some more weight this time, and there are even some light philosophical touches about the ethics of genetic engineering and abuse of technology. Violante may not be as well known as some other Godzilla foes like King Ghidorah or Mechagodzilla, but she's got one of the most creative and impressive designs of any Godzilla monster. She even manages to make Godzilla look small in some scenes. People looking for a bunch of balls-to-the-wall kaiju action may be a little disappointed here. Due to the nature of Biollante's design, she's not as mobile as some of Godzilla's other foes, and there aren't any knock-down, drag-out fights like in other movies. Still, there's enough going on plot-wise to keep you interested. This may be one of the lesser-known movies in the series, but I think this is actually a pretty good starting place for newcomers, since it treats the material seriously while still having the sense of fun that a Godzilla movie's supposed to have. And for people who are already hardcore G fans, I say give Godzilla vs. Biollante another look. Number 7. Godzilla vs. Destroyer, or Destroya if you want to be a purist about it. This was the final film of the second series of Godzilla movies known as the Heisei series, and the filmmakers decided to go out with a bang. Literally. In the opening scene, Godzilla attacks Hong Kong and looks like he's burning up from the inside. Turns out the radiation in Godzilla's body has gone haywire and he's now melting down like a nuclear reactor. If he melts down fully, it'll create an explosion that could destroy the entire world. 
At the time of this movie's release in 1995, a big deal was made out of the fact that Godzilla dies at the end. Of course he died in the first movie, but this time it was supposedly going to be permanent. I can even remember hearing about this on the news when I was a kid, years before the movie was ever available in North America. Of course, like any popular character, Godzilla didn't stay dead for very long. Although this is his only appearance so far, Destroya is one of the most memorable opponents ever in a Godzilla movie. It starts out as these tiny little parasites that were created by the Oxygen Destroyer, the weapon that killed the first Godzilla. And throughout the movie, it evolves into a variety of other forms, including these weird alien crab creatures. During these scenes, the movie feels closer to something like Aliens than a Godzilla movie. The creatures mutate into other forms, including a flying one, eventually coming together into one monster that looks like a Godzilla-fied version of the Devil. Godzilla's son also appears in this movie, and hey, what do you know? He actually looks like his father this time and doesn't squeeze like a donkey. That's a plus. Believe it or not, Godzilla Jr. does quite a bit of the fighting against Destroya, and at the end, it's actually the army that's responsible for beating him. Weird. Godzilla finally melts down at the end, but the army uses a freeze ray to prevent the explosion, and all of Godzilla's energy is transferred into his son, hinting at a further movie series that was never followed up on. It's a little disappointing that Godzilla isn't the one responsible for dealing the final blow to Destroya. Considering this was supposed to be the character's send-off, I think Godzilla sacrificing himself in order to truly defeat Destroya would have made for a better ending. But despite that minor complaint, this is still a very entertaining movie and a good end to the second series of films. Number 6. Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah It's weird to think that even though Ghidorah is Godzilla's number one enemy, it took decades for there to actually be a movie called Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. But in 1991, we finally got one, and it's one of the best and most clever movies of the series. It begins with a UFO landing in Japan, which makes it look like the plot is going to be about evil aliens again. Turns out the ship is actually piloted by humans from the far future. They tell everyone that they can travel back in time to World War II and transport the dinosaur that becomes Godzilla off the island it's on before the nuclear explosion that mutates it into Godzilla, effectively preventing Godzilla from ever being created. However, they replace the dinosaur with three cute, fuzzy little creatures called Dorats who end up fusing together and mutating into King Ghidorah. Yep, turns out the people from the future are evil, and since Godzilla's not around to stop them anymore, they use Ghidorah to subjugate Japan. However, a new Godzilla gets created thanks to a nuclear submarine, and so Godzilla's back, bigger and meaner than ever. I love how this movie subverts the usual Godzilla movie formula. They bring Godzilla back to defeat Ghidorah, which he does, even blowing one of his heads off. But after Ghidorah is defeated, then Godzilla starts causing trouble. So he goes from being the bad guy at the beginning, to being the hero, then back to being the bad guy again in one movie. Our saviors come back to protect us. Nope. Sorry, buddy. One thing I'm not a big fan of is Ghidorah's new origin. Before this, he was a planet-destroying dragon from outer space. I know that's vague, but I never needed specifics about exactly what he is or where he came from. And I think that's a lot more badass than the explanation they give here. I'm sorry, but these things are way too cute to end up becoming Godzilla's nemesis. But hey, they're only in the movie for a few minutes, so I can forgive that. This movie also has some of the best action sequences of the entire series. I mean, where else are you going to see Godzilla blow one of Ghidorah's heads off? Especially badass is when they bring Ghidorah back as Mecha King Ghidorah, giving him various mechanical parts and new weapons. This has one of the most unique and memorable plot lines of any Godzilla movie, and remains a fan favorite. It may have taken years for us to get Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, but it was worth the wait. Number 5. Godzilla 1985. Now here's where I start to break with a lot of G-fans in my top 10. Mainstream critics hated this movie when it came out, which is no surprise, but even Godzilla fans tend to dislike this movie. I've already talked about how the Godzilla series gradually became geared towards children, and Godzilla changed from being a scary, destructive monster to a friendly, superhero-type character. And after Terror of Mechagodzilla in 1975, the series went on hiatus for almost a decade. Then in 1984, Toho decided to re 
reboot the series and bring Godzilla back to his roots, making a direct sequel to the first film that ignored all other movies in the series. This movie is sometimes known as The Return of Godzilla, but in Japan it was released as simply Godzilla. After years of plots involving alien invaders and monster tag teams, the filmmakers decided to keep things simple. Thirty years after his original rampage, Godzilla returns to menace Tokyo once again. Also, given that it was now the 80s, there's also some Cold War drama involving a Soviet nuclear missile that gets launched at Tokyo, but that's just a secondary plotline. The first thing you'll notice is that compared to the previous movies in the series, the production values are much higher. Although it uses a lot of the same techniques, the suit, models, and animatronics all look much better than they did before, even if they're still not entirely convincing today. In 1985, the movie was re-edited and released in America by none other than B-Movie King pin Roger Corman, and it featured new scenes with Raymond Burr's character Steve Martin from the first Godzilla, although because Steve Martin the actor was popular at this time, they just call him Mr. Martin. Looking at the American version, I can kind of see where some of the fan hatred comes from. There's a lot of awkward product placement for Dr. Pepper, and it's pretty obvious that the producers of the American scenes didn't take the movie seriously. My God. I suck. Quite an urban renewal program they got going over there. Despite that, I think the rest of the movie works pretty well. This was an attempt to make Godzilla scary again and capture the menacing tone of the first film, and in that regard, I think it succeeds. I just love how dark this movie looks and feels. Most of it takes place at night, and even the scenes in the daytime have a really gray, somber look to them. From the very beginning when Godzilla first appears, there's an almost apocalyptic feel to some scenes in this movie, and it's easily the darkest film in the series since the first one. Another fan complaint is that Godzilla Godzilla doesn't fight another monster in the film, but he does battle with a weapon called the Super X, a flying machine specially designed to kill him, and the scenes where it's fighting Godzilla are easily the highlight of the movie. It's worth noting that as of 2014, this movie still hasn't gotten an official DVD or Blu-ray release in North America. Here's hoping they fix that soon so G fans can give this movie another chance. Just left Tokyo in August. Welcome, Godzilla. Number 4. Godzilla 2014. Yep, that's right, I'm actually putting an American Godzilla movie on this list. I know, blasphemy. After a disappointing attempt at the character in 1998, Hollywood decided to try again in 2014, and this time the results are a lot better. The plot is fairly straightforward. Two giant prehistoric creatures known as Mutos awaken after being dormant for millions of years, and the army has to figure out a way to stop them before they reproduce and potentially annihilate mankind. Meanwhile, Godzilla, another prehistoric monster that first appeared in the 1950s, re-emerges as well. Apparently it's to stop the Mutos, but no one's quite sure whether he's friend or foe. It all culminates in a good old-fashioned kaiju smackdown with San Francisco standing in for Tokyo. Whereas the 1998 version is almost universally hated by Godzilla fans, the reaction to this one's been a lot more divisive. A big sticking point for fans seems to be that Godzilla doesn't get a whole lot of screen time here, but honestly, this didn't bother me that much. I don't mind a slow reveal as long as there's an effective build-up, and I think this movie accomplishes that. The first time Godzilla appears as well as the first time he uses his radioactive beam are both great payoffs and had people cheering in the theater. More importantly, this version actually seems to get how Godzilla and his opponents should be portrayed. You really get a sense of just how big and powerful these creatures are, and that no matter what they do, the military is basically powerless against them. The only things that can stop them are each other, and in a Godzilla movie, that's exactly how it should be. This movie knows that Godzilla is supposed to be an unstoppable engine of destruction, not some anorexic iguana that runs away from the military and gets killed by a couple missiles at the end. One downside is that with the exception of Brian Cranston, most of the characters are a bit on the bland side, although to be honest, you could say that about a lot of the Japanese Godzilla movies, and none of the characters are obnoxious or stupid like in some other big American blockbusters. Despite its flaws, this movie succeeds in putting Godzilla in a big American blockbuster while still respecting the character. Many fans choose to call the monster in the 1998 version Zilla, saying that that movie took the god out of the character. But for the 2014 version, they remember to put it back in. <laughs> Number 3. Godzilla vs. Mothra 
or Mothra vs. Godzilla if you want to use the newer title. Hell, if you want the original American title, it's Godzilla vs. The Thing. The posters even made it look like Godzilla was supposed to fight some sort of octopus monster. Why the hell did old movie posters lie to people so much? This one is a real fan favorite and is usually considered one of the best in the entire series, and with good reason. Mothra had already appeared in her own movie in 1961, but this was the character's first appearance in a Godzilla film, and she would go on to become one of the most popular of all Japanese monsters, even getting her own film series in the 90s. Without getting into too much detail, Mothra is a giant insect god who has two twin fairies who are able to summon her by singing a song. Everybody got that? Good. The movie begins when a giant egg washes on shore during a hurricane, and a corrupt businessman with a Hitler mustache decides to exploit it for profit. Turns out the egg belongs to Mothra, and the twin fairies show up and tell the promoter to release the egg or else it'll make Mothra angry, but he just decides to kidnap the fairies and profit off them too. Pretty soon Godzilla shows up, making one of his weirdest entrances ever, rising up from the ground. It makes absolutely no sense, but it's awesome. The army tries everything to stop Godzilla, but it doesn't do any good. They try missiles, tanks, electricity. At one point, they even light his head on fire, but he just keeps coming. Mothra comes in before Godzilla is able to destroy her egg, and she actually puts up a pretty good fight against Godzilla. But of course, you know what happens when a moth meets a flame, don't you? Yeah. But just as Mothra dies, her egg hatches and two caterpillar Mothras take on Godzilla and avenge their mother. This is one of the most colorful and entertaining entries in the entire series and is highly recommended. <laughs> Number 2 GMK, or if you want the full title, Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah Giant Monsters All Out Attack. Think you got enough words in there, fellas? After Godzilla vs. Destroya, Toho decided to resurrect the series again, starting with Godzilla 2000 and ending with Godzilla Final Wars. This group of films is commonly known as the Millennium Series. All the films in this series are pretty good and worth checking out, but this one is my favorite. In fact, it's one of the most unique and original entries in the entire series. Just like Godzilla 1985, this one is a direct sequel to the first Godzilla that ignores all the other movies, although they do include a subtle dig at the 1998 Godzilla. The New York attack was Godzilla, right? by the defense forces. We now That's what only American the experts claim. But our guys here have doubts. Godzilla's a bad guy again in this movie, and he's given one of his most distinctive designs ever with solid white eyes. They also change Godzilla's origin and give him more of a mystical quality in this movie. Before, Godzilla was a dinosaur mutated by atomic radiation, but here it's implied that he's actually the embodiment of all the souls killed by Japan during World War II, and that his rampages are punishment for Japan's wartime aggression. So basically, it's like Godzilla's a ghost in this movie. Fortunately for Japan, it has several guardian monsters to protect it, including Mothra and King Ghidorah. That's right, Ghidorah is actually one of the good guys in this movie. To give you an idea of how weird this is, imagine if they made a movie where Commissioner Gordon gets the Joker to help defend Gotham City from Batman. Yeah, that weird. Baragon, a monster that first appeared in the movie Frankenstein Conquers the World, is one of the Guardians as well, but I guess he wasn't important enough to be part of the title. One area where this movie really shines is in showing the effect of Godzilla's rampages. In most Godzilla movies, you'd see buildings crumble and people running, but few of the actual casualties. Not here. In this movie, people actually get injured and die, and that helps to make the human part of the story a lot more interesting than other entries. On the downside, some of the CGI effects aren't that great, and the movie takes a little while to get going, but once it does, it delivers the goods. Some fans may be put off by the changes this movie makes to Godzilla lore, but this is a very satisfying monster flick, and one that proves that there's still room for originality in the Godzilla formula. Now if they could just do something about that damn title. And number one, Godzilla, the first one. This is where it all began. In 1954, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka and director Ishiro Honda decided to make a giant monster movie. And the result is one of the best and most important monster movies ever made, and one that kickstarted the kaiju genre in Japan. 
On the surface, the plot is nothing special. Atomic radiation awakens a giant prehistoric monster that proceeds to go on a rampage through Tokyo. This was pretty standard stuff for 1950s monster movies and is very similar to the American film The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms that was released a year earlier. What makes this film work is that the filmmakers don't treat it like just another B-movie. People who are only familiar with the more light-hearted later entries may be surprised by just how dark this movie is. Remember, this was made less than a decade after World War II, and the memories of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still fresh in people's minds. Godzilla is presented more as an unstoppable force of nature than a monster, and shots of people injured and dying after his rampage have some real power. Even when Godzilla's not on screen, there's a real sense of dread to this movie, and the moody black-and-white cinematography and Akira Ifakube's memorable score all help to give the movie a foreboding atmosphere that helps set it apart from other 50s monster movies. In 1956, the movie was re-edited and released as Godzilla King of the Monsters, featuring new scenes with actor Raymond Burr as reporter Steve Martin. Burr does a pretty good job in the role, but the American version cuts out some of the more intense scenes and also does away with a lot of the character development of the Japanese actors. If you've only ever seen this cut of the movie, I recommend you check out the original Japanese Japanese version just to get the full picture. Still, it was the American version that introduced people in North America to Godzilla and turned him from being just another movie monster into the global icon he is today. So for that, it deserves a place in history. I love Godzilla in all his incarnations, but for me, the original is still the best. Hail to the king, baby. So there you have it, my own personal top 10 Godzilla movies. Be sure and let me know what your favorites are in the comments below. Well, thanks for watching my 50th episode. I hope I get to do 50 more and that we get 60 more years of Godzilla.